Well, welcome movie lovers and theology nerds to a very special presentation of Popcorn Theology Live. And we're going to look at a fun and just spirit-lifting film called The Pale Blue Eye, right? Uh, quite different from a lot of our other selections, which can you know, often be superhero films or different things. We, we did make sure it had Batman, so... Uh, but our tagline reads like this, right? This world-weary detective is hired to investigate the murder of a West Point cadet and enlists none other than a young man the world would come to know as Edgar Allan Poe. And of course, you've all seen the film now, so no fear of spoilers, but this film may not be the most obvious film or, or maybe an easy film. A lot of movies often will have one theme or, or maybe a couple themes that they're playing with. And this one ruminates really on a lot of of heavy themes. The first one, of course, being the perspective, the perspective of the investigators, and then as the film unfolds there in the last act, you realize the perspective of the viewer and the perspective of really everyone when it comes to understanding the truth. We have uh, some interesting interplay around the idea of rules, regulations, and institutions and academies. And of course, it wouldn't be Edgar Allan Poe unless we dealt with the heart. And other telltale signs of suffering, spirituality, vengeance, and then in that final moment, a small act of mercy. And of course, it features this a fictional account of a very real historical figure, Edgar Allan Poe. Any Poe fans in the room? Edgar Allan Poe, for those who might not know, lived from 1809 to 1849. American writer, poet, and literary critic, known for his poetry and short stories, Maybe not the poem we heard in this film. But of course, most of his tales were of mystery and the macabre. He's actually, little known fact, considered the inventor of the detective fiction genre. And is first, one of the first well-known American writers to earn a living through writing alone. Wait for it. Resulting in a financially difficult life and career. But at least four of Poe's writings are referenced. The actual origin of the title of the film comes from the telltale heart. It says, one of his eyes resembled that of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of that eye forever. Of all the things that drive us to commit murder. My eyes are a little pale and blue, so glad Poe didn't see me. Of course, that little quote that came up right at the beginning, the boundaries which divide life and death are at best shadowy and vague. Who shall say where one ends and the other begins? That's from the premature burial, which seems apropos. Uh, he also tells Leah of his visions from his mother about Lenore, which of course is an allusion to one of Poe's most famous poems, The Raven. And then, of course, if you, very few people know this, and I've actually never read it, but Poe's last short story that he ever wrote is entitled Landor's Cottage. So maybe something, a little something to check out. But of course, that brings us to the curious case of Augustus Landor and the first intriguing aspect of this film. And I can say from experience now, having seen it three times, that it is one of those films that becomes not just equally interesting on a rewatch, but I think even superior in kind of watching and understanding than the first watch. Knowing, of course, that Landor is, in fact, the murderer from the opening scene. There he is, fresh back from the murder, you know, washing off his hands in the stream as then he's called up by the horn, by the trumpet, and summoned. And, of course, then realizing what the situation actually is, watching him in each subsequent scene as he manipulates it, knowing what you know now, in fact, even that scene where he's belittling Poe mid-film mid there for daring to lie to him, mandating that he share the whole truth, and, it, and actually accusing him, did you murder these two men? He did, right? We have, a man, we have a movie where the man crying out for truth is the primary one concealing it. And so it, it's, it's almost comical on a second viewing when he's yelling at the father for indulging his daughter's occult endeavors. He shouts, communicating with the dead, that's not normal, but murder, that's inhuman. Someone has to hang for this. But again, 
murderous Landor himself. And yet he's the one who brings the fact that it's murder to everyone's attention. Why would he even do that in the first place? Couldn't he just let that stay hidden? He even questions the connection of the animal mutilations. He's the one who says, well, it might, these, these things might not be the same man. Which, of course, cutting out the heart and the animal mutilations, they aren't. Even putting the idea that more than one person could be involved. It, it's like we might ask why, but it puts him in a way beyond suspicion because he's willing to posit the very things that might at some point incriminate him. It allows him to control the situation to ultimately then pin the murder on those who desecrated the body and commit the subsequent murders that will all be tied to the one that he pins it on. And we, we're, we introduced to Landor, we learn he's many things, right? Widower, father, drunkard has the reputation. See, he says himself, he has not darkened the door of a church in a long time, but yet he's a son of a minister, and he has lived his life as a man of the law. And those last two, I think, to me, are, are the most interesting. So you have the man of the law raised by a minister, and we see where his attitude is when he raises that glass mockingly after just being told not to drink and says, toast what? Here's to rules. Here's to rules. And, and of course, by the end of the film, we understand why he is so anti-rule. Well, my supposition, at least, is that he believes rules and religion have failed him. The military commander asks if he has latent hostility against the academy. He says, yes, I do. The academy takes away a young man's will. It fences him with regulations and rules, deprives him of reason. It makes him less human. And, of course, we can step back now and see like, he saw three inhuman young men who were responsible for the rape of his daughter. And he's, he's asked then, are you implying the academy is to blame for these deaths? He says, someone connected to the academy? Yes, hence the academy itself. And then he gets to that great line we all loved, by your standard then, every crime committed by a Christian will be a stain on Christ. And Landor says, and so it is. We'll come back to that, but the idea, of, the idea that regulations and rules deprive us of reason and make us less human, that it turns young men into being beings capable of rape and murder, which might be a little funny since that accusation is coming from a murderer at this point, but it also assumes some things, those, those ideas assume something about a human's heart prior to encountering those rules and regulations, doesn't it? Poe brings out the idea, the heart is a symbol or it is nothing. To remove a man's heart is to traffic in symbol. And Poe then has a point, even quoting the Bible, create in me a clean heart. He said it's not the literal organ, but it's what it symbolizes. And when we look at the biblical heart, what the Bible would say about the telltale heart, and Poe actually might agree with in some ways, Job 31 says, I love this. Job 31 says, Have I covered my transgressions as others do by hiding my iniquity in my heart? Seems very fitting for Landor. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I even loved when, when he says, when he's wandering there in bed with Patsy, he says, you know, this whole family seems like they're guilty of something. And what does she say? Aren't all families guilty of something? We come to the age-old debate of whether evil is systemic and institutional or individual and coming from the heart. That the world will often have the, the view that people have basically good hearts, we're born morally neutral or born morally innocent, and we're corrupted by institutions or corrupted by systems, regulations, those things that are fencing us in. Conversely, the Bible says people are corrupt in their hearts from conception. We have a sin nature. So institutions, well certainly institutions will always find themselves with varying levels of corrupt individuals or then conspire, individuals conspiring together. But it doesn't begin in the institution. It begins with the hearts that come into that institution. At one point early in the film, the commander says, uh, he's talking about making soldiers. He's like, to that end, we drive them. But we'd like to think that we know when to stop driving them. Because at that point, he's fearing he's driven a young man to suicide, which he hasn't. So on, on, 
on first viewing, it's easy for most of the film to side with our cynical, jaded selves and Landor and think ill of the military or ill of institutions. But the military academy did not drive these boys to rape. The military academy did not drive a boy man to suicide. The military institution did not, did not drive Leah into the occult. I, I know it's, if some, of you might be, some of you might bristle here, but Hitchcock may not be a likable character, but is it so terrible he's enforcing curfew when people are dying? When those who are breaking it are the types who rape and dabble in the occult? The one responsible for Landor's suffering and luring in Poe for what almost ended in sacrifice and death. On second viewing, I won't say I like Captain Hitchcock as a man, but he's frustratingly correct on a lot of things that he says. The evil here is not rule keepers, it's rule breakers, which Poe, of course, then uncovers on so many levels. And, is led to, and it's led to suffering, which is why we can have a healthy, certainly we can have a healthy measure of sympathy for Landor, empathy. The rape of his daughter and his inability to fix it, right? what, what any father would want to do. Indeed, on a second watch, when Leah's father's talking about what led him to allow his daughter and family to explore the occult, why is it? He couldn't save his daughter, he couldn't fix the problem. That same helplessness in regard to her illness is the same helplessness Landor feels watching his daughter deal with her emotional trauma. But the one thing he doesn't do, although it's not, he doesn't have a, big spe a huge speech about it, but it's very clear that he won't turn to God and doesn't believe in God. At one point he even says, he, as they reveal those tender those moments that were terrible between them, She's sitting there praying, his daughter's praying, and he says, he can't help you, let me help you. When his daughter's desperately praying, does he join her? Does he pray with her or for her? And he hugs her and says, everything will be all right, it'll all turn out. But he has nothing to back that up. He doesn't believe there is a God or an afterlife or anything. There's no transcendent or ultimate, ultimate justice to be had here or in the kingdom to come. It's reflected in the comment he makes to Poe at the end. He says, they'll be remembered forever as murderers. That's what Poe fears. And Landor replies sullenly, there's no forever. They'll be forgotten just like the rest of us. He calls Poe's musings on the dead and, the sp and on spirits senseless fantasies. And I'm not suggesting Poe's view of the afterlife is correct, mind you. But it's obvious he has an absence of anything in that direction. This kind of hopelessness then is what drives a man to take vengeance into his own hands. For a man to, and for a man who claims to hate rules, wow, he lives by the Old Testament axiom of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. For his daughter's death, he will deal death to those he deems led to it. And he says he doesn't even want them confessed and convicted and taken to court. He says, I didn't want them to confess. I wanted them to die. And when Poe says he would have offered comfort, he says, I don't think I can be comforted on that particular subject. Right, for Landor, there's no comfort to be had. He kind of scoffs at the idea that there are any messages coming from beyond, although we wouldn't say they come from dead mothers or from old witch hunters. But it's clear he sees that all is coincidence, cause and effect. There's no providence, there's no divine aid, there's no intercession. The links that we make between events, uh, like uh, romantics like Poe will, it, he doesn't see any meaning in that. And does the movie give us any definitive hope in terms of the afterlife? Does it even give proof to the restless spirit motif? Do we, we're, we're left wondering, was she really hearing? Was, was she just crazy and, and coming up with these things in her head? Or was she really hearing from her great-great-grandfather? Does Poe really hear from his mother? Well, to the dismay of cinematic aficionados who prefer things very clear, it remains as ambiguous as many would say things are in real life. Was Leah hearing the voice of her ancestor? Was she crazy? As a Christian, I might even posit that it could have been demonic. But the movie leaves us like it leaves Landor with nothing that absolutely proves it, nothing he might hang his hat on, nothing to then in turn give him hope that there is a hereafter, which is why I interpret the ending as being his own suicide. 
following his daughter into a surrender to an icy grave and a tragedy, which makes this, puts this in the category of movies I would call life under the sun, a sense of hopelessness and meaninglessness. He's even unable to accept the mercy, it seems, is offered to him by Poe at the end. Mercy given even as we consider that perhaps, as Landor kind of says, he ultimately kind of wanted Poe to uncover him. We go back to that line earlier in the movie, he says, with enough patience, the suspect will often interrogate himself. And again, for someone seemingly against rules, he could not help but hold himself accountable and kind of give himself away which actually is, is quite, quite in keeping with some of Poe's stories about hearts that ultimately, despite ourselves, yearn to confess. No, we need conviction. Mid-film, he tells Poe that line, and of course, over then the course of the film, Landor consciously or unconsciously gives the truth to Poe. Poe says, the note you were careless to leave that, you were careless to leave that with me. It's like, no. Was it carelessness or guilty conscience that while maybe unable to outright confess, gave Poe the keys to convict? And he's in a pretty good place. They have a scapegoat. But Poe then has those pair of notes. And it just, it just it tears my heart out as Poe burns them. What do we see that he does? He, just, he sinks into his chair and weeps. Like whereas he gave those boys what, what, let's be honest, many of us might say they deserved, but then pinned murder on a crazy brother and sister, which led to the death of Poe's love, Poe doesn't deal out the same to Landor and doesn't give Landor what he deserves, doesn't turn him in. And, and I think that kind of crushes Landor to see that happen, because part of him wants justice and part of him wants Maybe just rest. I suppose some of us can interpret his weeping as thankful or mortified or relieved or convicted or maybe all of them at once, but he gets mercy, though perhaps not, not in a sense any sense of full forgiveness. Because again, this film falls short of any full or clear gospel parallel. It traffics in, in all these themes, but with a sense of melancholy and uncertainty. So before we close, uh, uh, two final thoughts, one on rules or law, or mercy, or maybe perhaps I might say love, because is it not an act of love that Poe does by burning the notes? The first law, the law's effect on the heart and Landor's indictment, that somehow the rules lead to incitement. What is the law's effect on the heart, which he seems to think is so negative? Biblically, in a weird way, he's not entirely wrong about one way and the effect that rules have on the heart. Romans 7 actually says something curious. It says, what shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if, I had not, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law hadn't said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy. And the commandment is holy and righteous and good, but I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I delight in the law of God, but I see in my members another law waging war against my, the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Like all of us, if we stop and think about it, there have been times in my life where my mom says, whatever you do, don't do this. I wasn't even planning to do it, but now part of me wants to. A law in our face makes a sinful heart want to flout it. 
The landlord would cry out, your constraining rules make a man inhuman. It's like, no, good rules illustrate and exacerbate our innate inhumanity, or perhaps more biblically put, depravity. It's like Marlon Brando in the film The Wild Ones, classic line when someone asks him, what are you, what are you rebelling against? And his answer, what do you got? That's the human heart. So we go back to Landor's accusation. He says, every crime committed by a Christian will be a stain on Christ. Just like if it's connected with the academy, then the academy's to blame. Is every crime committed by a Christian a stain on Christ? Landor would say, and so it is. As a Christian, we have to grapple with a slight variance there. No sin I commit actually puts any stain on Christ. But sins Christian commit put a stain on the name of, which makes it at least a double, if not great, more sin than just the sin itself. As we've throwing shade on the name we say we're imitating. So he's both right and wrong in a sense. It's a stain on the name of, but surely no stain on Christ or the reality and the truth that he brings. In fact, truth comes in some strange forms in this film, and that's the final point. There's a moment where the beguiling and perhaps bedeviled Leah says to Poe, sacrifice is the ultimate expression of love. And of course, they're about to kill him, and it's like, he's not a willing participant. That might actually be a part of, you know, sacrifice is the ultimate expression of love. I'm not sure unwilling sacrifice is the ultimate expression of love. And he's a little confused and realizing he probably doesn't want to be there. And maybe when he said, I'd do anything, he didn't mean anything. (laughs) But this actually hints at some ingredients of the gospel, perhaps a a perversion of the gospel. Because Landor's vengeance becomes very sullied by his actions. If we even want to see some justice, or maybe maybe we actually kind of like the vengeance that he takes, part of us. It becomes very sullied when we realize that he's choosing to make someone else an unwilling scapegoat. Someone else is going to pay the price for his sins. And then later we see Leah believes there's some miraculous way she can sacrifice uh, the unwilling Poe to have immortality and eternal life. And these distortions, which are both grabbing at unwilling parties to make scapegoat and make sacrifice, That's how we actually see in the good news of Jesus Christ. That's a perverted gospel. Jesus, in Scripture, we're told that He becomes our scapegoat. He pays the price of the sins of those who do turn to Him willingly. We see Jesus then willingly lay down His life, become the sacrifice that does lead to eternal life. These are not things we can engineer for ourselves. These are not things we can obtain by our own practices. And it's even true, rule-keeping will not save us. But these things are offered freely without our merit. Even more amazing than Poe choosing to offer mercy by burning the convicting evidence of Landor's sins. See, this narrative is yearning for a deeper grace. It's yearning for some kind of unmerited favor that is needed to cure the hearts and the situations. But it seemingly ends cold and with a silence that like Poe's spirits are clamoring to be heard. So I hope that you guys enjoyed something a little bit different. And while it's a, certainly a slow burner in terms of a film, I found it pretty interesting. Poe writes, the boundaries which divide life and death are at best shadowy and vague. Who shall say where one ends and where the other begins? Another writer much earlier in history than Poe, John the Apostle, answers that question when he records that Jesus says, I am the beginning and the end. And also, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way to life, the way to God, is through him. And despite Landor's sad denial, he can help you. And so it is. Let's pray. Father, thank you for some time tonight just to dig into a film that is perhaps a little deeper or a little more sobering than, than some of, that some of, some of us enjoy on a regular basis. 
And I pray sometimes we can tackle heavier themes or engage things that do pull up the deeper things and make us question, make us converse. Well, Lord, I pray any sense of hopelessness that might come from a story like this, or perhaps even by reading some Poe, can be filtered and mitigated by the promise and hope and the meaning that scrubs out the meaninglessness that can sometimes be felt by a narrative like this. I pray that we have hope, but can understand then how some people walk through this life cold and without it. And maybe we can be a light in that darkness in Jesus' name. Amen.